All right, you kids, get out of here. <laughs> That's the first time this has ever been wrong. Isn't it, Tosh? No. I just can't remember it. Oh, maybe it's because I have a bad memory. I just can't remember oh, yeah. it. Wrong. Okay, well, how do you like that? Matthew chapter 4 in your scriptures today, if you don't have a Bible, there are some around you, and if you see someone that needs a Bible, please be conscientious enough to grab one and hand it to them. And it's one of the things that we want to be a distinctive of this ministry. If you look over here on this wall, uh, the part of Psalm 138.2 is quoted, the second part, I'll worship toward thy holy hill, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And that last statement, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name, has been a motto from the beginning of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Literally, if God thinks so much of his word, then we ought to think a lot of it as well. And so we want you to know that what's preached here comes from the word of God. We believe the Bible when it says that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. It's inspired of God. It's profitable for all those things. We believe the Word of God when it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Literally, many people say things like, well, that's your interpretation. We don't have private interpretation of the Word of God. That is, God says what He means. He means what He says. And if you and I are honest about it with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can know what He says and what He means. And I don't want to sow a doubt, but sometimes you can't just trust, trust the preacher. You've got to trust God's Word. And I believe it holds a preacher to honesty when you open your Bibles. And, you know, it, I, I'm not an old-timer. I'm not old-fashioned. And I don't think I ever will be. I'll probably be young until the day I die. But uh, I don't call myself old-fashioned. But it bothers me a little bit that we're getting away from the Bible in churches. You know, pretty much people go to church now, in the average church, and they don't carry a Bible with them. And I'm, I'm like you. I'm judgmental in my thinking. And I just think if they don't bother carrying a Bible to church, they probably don't bother opening a Bible at home. And I know that people have Bibles on their app, you know, apps, on their cell phones, and that sort of thing. But it's just not the same as getting this book and opening it up and spending time in it and getting God to help you understand it. So you say, Pastor, well, you're kind of stuck in the dark ages. This is the digital age and so forth. Hey, this is digital printing that they use to print this <laughs> copy of the Scripture. But it is a uh, hard copy. And I recommend that you get you one. And you'll know what I mean. Uh, I'm trying to break in. This is a brand new Bible. First time I've ever tried to preach out of it. And I, it's tough for me because when I when I get to spend time with a book, that particular Bible kind of becomes, I know this is weird, but it becomes my friend. And uh, we, we spend time together and sometimes you'll, you'll see a smudge or a teardrop or a note or something in it and you just remember, man, we had a great time there. And these, make memories with your Bible. I would recommend that for you. But I said all that to say, uh, open, open the Scripture and get in it when we're in the Word of God. And one last thing before we read our text that I can mention that is a benefit of that will be that even if the message is boring and the preacher is no good, at least you'll have something good to read if you open your Bible. Okay. Not even, nobody even cracked a smile over that. <laughs> wow, you're tough. Okay. You know, like, you know, don't, don't tempt me, Pastor. I tuned you out already. Matthew chapter 4, let's look down to verse 12. And we'll actually read most of the rest of the chapter. Uh, verse 12 of Matthew chapter 4. The scripture says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, and a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left their ship and their father and followed him. And verse 23 will be the last verse we'll read today. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manners of sickness and all manners of disease <coughs> among the people. And I know there's more to the context, but we'll have to read the rest of the book to finish the context. So we'll stop there because of time today. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to give us understanding now, shall we? Father, this book is indeed alive and it is indeed profitable. And so we not only believe that and affirm that, but now it is the time of the service when we ask you to help us to profit by your word. God, if it's teaching that we need, I pray that you would help us to have sound doctrine taught here today. God, if it's correction that we need here today, Lord, give it to us very, very plainly, very, very simply. And God, we ask very mercifully. God, whether it would be reproof showing us the way to, to uh, the ways that we're wrong about things, or God, if it would be instruction in righteousness, I pray that each of us today would have the purpose that you want for us fulfilled because of the preaching of your word. Lord, it's a lot to ask, and so we depend on you and your spirit for it now. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is absolutely a wonderful uh, passage of scripture. All passages of Scripture are. We're in a series right now, if, you, if you're just joining in with us. We're in a series in Matthew. And as we're preaching through the series, we have preached through Matthew before. The last time I preached through Matthew, a few years ago, we emphasized the theme of discipleship. And actually, this passage that we're in today would open that theme for us. It would uh, begin to show us discipleship. And I will say this. If you're studying along individually, and I recommend that you do, while we're preaching through a book, you'd be amazed what a help it is for you to make that book a personal study. But if you have been uh, studying Matthew or if you've uh, read books about Matthew before, many times Matthew as a gospel is confusing because of the matter of discipleship. That is, many believers don't understand the difference between being saved and being a disciple. They make them one and the same. And so commands for discipleship or for disciples are oftentimes applied incorrectly, unbiblically, to requirements for salvation. And when you do that, salvation becomes very, very complicated, first of all. If you take every command to a disciple and require a lost person to fulfill those commands in order to be born again, what have you made the gospel? Say it? Works. Works. You've taken a gospel which is simply that we are sinners and that we deserve death and that uh, we are God's enemies and that Jesus is God's Son who came to die in our place for sin and that Jesus said the gospel is that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And you've taken the gospel, which is looking to Jesus and the fact that He died for our sin, was buried and rose again, and receiving Jesus. You've taken and you said, okay, you've got to receive Jesus, and you know, you've know you got to do this and this and this and this, and there's no end to commands for disciples. And unfortunately, that's very much in vogue today. There are many terms that we have in Christianity that I've used, that I've grown up using, that when I examine them on the basis of what Jesus said the gospel is. And by the way, I'll argue with anyone that will try to say that Jesus can't present the gospel well. Jesus said what the gospel was when he gave it to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And a lot of believers will add a lot of things to the gospel more than what Jesus said. And I'll just tell you this, you don't know the gospel better than the one who is the gospel. No one knows the gospel better than Jesus does. And so if you wish to complicate the gospel, my friend, you disparage 
the Son of God, who Himself is the Gospel. And you uh, literally, I believe, oftentimes have fallen into the pride of believing that there are things that you do that make you better or qualify you more so for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Here are some statements, though, that are discipleship statements misapplied and uh, that are incorrect. Have you ever heard this before? If He isn't Lord of all, He isn't Lord at all. That's clever, isn't it? It's catchy, isn't it? Is it true? The first condition says, it's a conditional sentence, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, He isn't Lord at all. And now they mean He isn't your Lord at all. I think, if, if you're going to be honest about it, that's what I've meant when I've said that. If He isn't Lord of all, He isn't Lord at all. Now let me ask you a question. What does it take to demonstrate that Jesus is not Lord of your life for an individual. I don't want to get into a lordship discussion this morning, but I just want to help us with some things that will help with the study. What does it take? I'll tell you what it takes. It takes disobedience. In other words, if in any area of your life you're disobedient, that's an area that Christ's lordship is not being practiced. Is that not so? Can a Christian demonstrate disobedience and still be a believer? Can you be a disobedient and still be a believer? Well, I've never met a fully obedient Christian. Never met a perfect person, have you? And so, if you're going to take that statement and you're going to make it true, then the, matter, the question there really is, to what degree is it true? The fact of the matter is that's a man-made statement, that's a man's proverbs, and it doesn't line up. The, the doctrine of biblical lordship is taught that, friend, Jesus is Lord whether you acknowledge Him or not. And if you're a believer, Christ is your Lord whether you acknowledge Him or not, whether you obey Him or not. A disobedient Christian... Jesus is still the Lord of. Okay, here's another one. We say about a person who claims to be a believer and who has sin in their life, sometimes we say, by their fruits ye shall know them. Right? But when you examine that text, as we will later on in Matthew, what you see is that the Bible says, Beware of false prophets, for they're coming to you as sheep, as wolves in sheep's clothing. By their fruits ye shall know them. So whose fruits is it that we can know them by? False prophets are known by their fruits. You say, well, pastor, it translates well. It works well. It's clever, but it's a man-made doctrine. And the problem with the man-made doctrine is that it actually adds to requirements that God gives for salvation. And my friend, there's no victory in that. You tell a person, you've got to do this and this and this, or I'm not going to believe you're saved, and he'll try to measure up, but he'll despair because he'll try to do it in the flesh instead of with the help of the Spirit of God. And there are a lot of frustrated Christians because of man-made doctrines who instead of being taught how to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh have been told you've got to do this or you're not even born again. And ultimately, I have seen believers who I believe have trusted Christ as their Savior as much as I can know a person, I've seen them get frustrated and angry with God because they cannot have victory. They think God just, when you get saved, you just, now you can't sin anymore. You can't do wrong anymore. But the Bible very, very plainly indicates that a Christian can sin. 1 John is very, very clear about fellowship and about how that our fellowship with God, our fellowship with believers, is, on, is conditioned by not having sin in our lives. And we see that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And those are fellowship requirements. Those scriptures are not written to lost people. They're written to the saved. Okay, now that's not the point of the message this morning, but we're approaching discipleship, and I do want to qualify that being a disciple and being a believer are not the same. I'm going to use one last illustration of that, and I'm going to use a personal illustration. Now, there was Judas Thaddeus, right? And then there was Judas Iscariot of the 12 disciples, right? Now, let me just ask you a practical question. <laughs> Judas Iscariot, are we going to rub shoulders with him in heaven? It's not a trick question. Go ahead and say what's on your mind. Charlie, answer for everybody. Just say it good and loud. No! Judas Iscariot is not in heaven. Okay. Was Judas Iscariot a disciple? Yeah, he sure was. So discipleship doesn't save a person. and Discipleship isn't being saved. You guys going to see that? You see that in the Scripture? We'll see it uh, here. Now, it's very interesting, and this isn't the text. Or isn't the, it, it, I, I try not to teach what the Scripture doesn't say, but there are some things that aren't said that are interesting for meditation and for thinking. It's very interesting that in the Scripture we see no account of the call of Judas to be a disciple. My assumption of Judas is that he would have been one of the twelve disciples 
of Jesus, I mean of John the Baptist, who would have left John the Baptist and started following Jesus. That's my assumption. But if the Bible doesn't tell us how, where, when that Judas Iscariot was called. I think that's kind of important, isn't it? Because some people uh, have doubting questions about our Savior and about His being led of God and His making right choices and decisions. Because they say, well, if He's a good Savior, if He's a perfect God and He knows the hearts of men, then why did He choose Judas Iscariot to be His disciple? And that's a pretty good question, but I think that the answer to the question lies in the fact that you never find Jesus calling Judas to be His disciple. That's not a doctrine, okay? Don't go and write, you know, Pastor Price says this and make a, create a doctrine or something like that. I could be wrong about that. That's just, those are some thoughts that I've had as I've studied and I've pondered on it. And so when I share thoughts, they're only my opinion. The Scripture doesn't expressly teach that anywhere. And so it may be a helpful consideration for you, but please only take it as a helpful consideration. And if you know that I'm wrong, just reject it instantly because I can be wrong and uh, oftentimes am. Yeah. Hopefully not often when I'm preaching. Now, verse 12 of our passage today, we get right into the Scripture. And the Bible says, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Now, this is a, the verses 12 through 16 give quite a little bit of information that doesn't seem to really be teaching anything, right? In other words, it says, geographically, Jesus, in verse 13, leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast and the borders of Zabulon and Naphtali. But then we see the purpose for this being in the Scripture. Verse 14, the Bible says that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. Okay, so what is, why is this included in the Scripture where Jesus was? Well, because of, of two things that we'll see. First of all, if you'll go to Isaiah chapter 9, you can hold your place. You don't necessarily have to go there, but I'm going to read the Scripture that's quoted. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, the Bible says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan. In verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light hath shined. Now it's multiplied the nation and not increase the joy. They joy before the according to the joy and harvest, and as men do rejoice when they divide the spoil. Okay, now there's two things that I want to answer. I know that we're moving and it, it, it's, it's a long thought flow, so I'll just tell you what I'm going to say, and then I'll show it to you in the Scripture. What I'm going to say in just a second is that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Scripture to a T, and Jesus it was Jesus was required or was necessary for Jesus to actually have roots in Nazareth and roots in Bethlehem of Judea and roots in in Egypt. Just like Hosea eleven two says, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And in Matthew chapter two we quote that passage of Scripture, Jesus Christ fulfilled absolutely every single prophecy in his earthly ministry. And lest the sentence get too long, let me state this as well. The ministry of Jesus when He came to this earth was not to conquer the world, was not to set up Christ's kingdom. The ministry that Jesus came for was to seek and save that which is lost. He said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And Jesus came also to prove that He was the Christ, the Messiah. That is, we're told in the Gospels that the miracles that Jesus did proved that He was the Messiah. Nicodemus, when he came to Jesus, said it. He said, uh, no man uh, can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So why did Jesus minister? What did Jesus come for? Well, he came to die for sins. And one of the things that Jesus' ministry was, was proving that he was God. Why was it important for Jesus to heal every person's sickness? Why was it important for Jesus to calm the waves and calm the winds of the sea? Why was it important for Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead? Was it because these men would die no more? Was it because once He'd healed a person, they'd never be sick again? No, He did these things proving He was God. And it was necessary for people to be faced with the reality that Jesus was God. My friend, you cannot read the prophecy of the Scripture and you cannot look at the things that God has done and be fair in concluding that, there, that Jesus was not God. 
Jesus fulfilled every prophecy of the Scripture proving He was the Messiah. And Jesus did things that were humanly impossible that proved that He was the Messiah. Jesus is God. But one of the things we will continue to see and we have already seen in Matthew is that every time Jesus did something which proved beyond doubt that He was God, that there were two responses. The first response we see in the Scripture is that many believed. And the second response we see in the Scripture is that many believe not. Nevertheless, many believe not. That's one of the most confusing statements in the Scripture. Jesus did what? And you don't believe? And friend, I want to just challenge you this morning that if you're this here this morning and you question or you doubt whether or not Jesus is God, it is not because God's Word does not show us who Jesus is and because that isn't enough evidence. It absolutely is. If you don't believe that Jesus is God, it is not because it takes too much faith for you to believe in the supernatural. If you choose to believe that Jesus is not God, my friend, it's because you have made an intellectual choice of your will to say, I will not believe. It is not because of lack of evidence, it is in spite of the evidence that any person believes not, and yet many do. Matter of fact, I will say this, I do not personally know what the statistics are God does, and only God does, but more people don't believe than do. That has nothing to do with the facts. And you know it's true on a personal level, don't you? You know it's true for some people you know at least. Has anyone ever believed something about you that wasn't true? <laughs> if it wasn't true, were there facts to support it? No. No. Do they believe it anyway? Yes. Is there any convincing someone who believes something in spite of the facts? No. It's the, one of the toughest things to deal with in life, isn't it? Somebody believes something about you, and facts have nothing to do with it. And so you can't do anything about what they believe. No. They just believe it. I just know you did, I just know you think, or I just know you said. Man, you just can't answer that. Because that's, they have faith. They actually believe something that's not true. And people do the very same thing in not believing in Jesus, my friend. They take what the Bible says may be known of God, what God has placed in our hearts, according to Romans 1, according to Psalm 19. And in spite of what God has shown us, they turn the truth of God <coughs> into a lie. And friend, that's because of man's wicked imaginations and man's deceitful heart. And you can imagine anything you like to if you're unwilling to believe. Let me appeal to you this morning. Can I please appeal to you this morning to be a believer in Jesus? Listen, if you will believe, you can. I've had people say before, you know, brother, I just wish, you know, I like what you say. I like what you preach. And you know, I like the way you live. And I just wish I could just believe all that. You know, it's sort of a patronizing kind of a statement. Like, well, you know, if I could just be as dumb as you, I'd be happy. You know, is what they mean by it. But actually, the fact of the matter is, is what they're actually saying is, is totally disingenuous. You can believe because your disbelief is in spite of the evidence. And so that's what we see here in these verses. First of all, we see that Jesus... Uh, fulfills the prophets. Can, can you go with me? Do you mind going over a couple of Gospels to John chapter 7 real quickly? John chapter 7. I'd like to show you something. In verse 40, we'll just read this story. This is a, this is a story that cracks me up, by the way. Some things just, just make me laugh. And I just this is one of those accounts in the scripture where uh, the the way that Jesus confounded the people who opposed him oftentimes is just laughable. Uh, verse forty, the the council the they they actually um, wanted Jesus to be captured or taken, and Nicodemus was part of this council. Verse forty of John chapter seven. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, "Of a truth, this is the prophet." Others said, "This is the Christ." But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of Him. And some of them would have taken Him, but no man laid hands on Him. So here's the argument. They said, He can't be the Christ because He's, because he's Jesus of Nazareth. He's supposed to come from Bethlehem. Well, do we have some witnesses that Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Yeah. The shepherds, the wise men from, from uh, 
Babylon, we believe. The uh, Herod, who killed every child under the age of two years old. Was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Yes. Were there witnesses? Yes. Okay. Uh, what about Egypt? Well, Hosea 11. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Was Jesus from Egypt? Yes. When you read the Old Testament of the Scripture and you see the prophecies of Messiah, you're like, well, is he from Bethlehem or is he from Egypt? Or is he from Nazareth? And the answer to that is yes. See, not many people can be from that many places, particularly not in the culture of the day. Isn't that amazing how that God confirmed the Scripture and proved that Jesus was the Messiah? And now look down in chapter uh, 7. When Nicodemus stood up for Jesus, Nicodemus became a believer if you study the Scripture. Uh, verse 50, Nicodemus saith unto him, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. Now, I don't mean to be overly technical today, and I don't mean to be unkind, but these are some dumb dudes. Because Jonah was from Galilee and he was a prophet. Jonah was from Galilee. He said, do we have any prophets out of Galilee? Yes. They think they made a point. I mean, they are just so clever. You know, you show me where there's a prophet from Galilee. And all of them were so ignorant of Scripture, that was a good argument. I run into this quite frequently, actually. I remember the first time when I was, uh, I was an assistant pastor in Delray Beach. Uh, yeah, this would be back in the year 2000. I gone to Winn-Dixie to get some things for the church, and I had the church van. And when I came out, there was somebody standing at the church van waiting for me. It was a Jehovah's Witness. And he wanted to argue with me. And I was pissy. I needed to get... I had people waiting on me. I had things to do. And I told him, I said, and you know me, I'm so sarcastic. I said, I would like nothing better than to argue with you all day, but I'm busy. I've got to go. You know? I, I think I said something, I love nothing better than to waste my time and argue with you, but I'm busy and I've got to go. And he wanted to argue... And I, I told him, I said, I just honestly don't. I said, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And I affirm what the Scripture says about that. I just don't want to argue with you. And I went to leave again in the van. He's like, well, answer me one question. He said, where's the word Trinity found in the Bible? And I said, the word Trinity is not found in the... He says, ha! Well, he won that argument. You know, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. So Jesus can't be God. Well, the Godhead's found all over the Scripture. And actually, and that's the word that we describe the Trinity as. The, the Bible declares, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. The Trinity is taught all the way through. The doctrine of the Trinity is taught all the way through the Scripture. But the man thought he had a winning argument because of a word that's not in the Bible. Ha! Well, that's the same kind of stupid argument. I said stupid. Well, my wife didn't hear. She's in the back room, isn't she? Let me uh, redact that. If you guys will scratch that from the record for today. Uh, what's a nice word for stupid? Dumb. <laughs> anyway. Moronic. Idiotic. Retarded. Oh, I, don't know. I don't think we're getting any better. I think we should just scratch it. Okay, let's just... Foolish. Foolish! There we go. All right. I mean, not to ask Tony for help. Okay. All right. So, folks, the fact of the matter is that if you read Isaiah chapter 9 like we did just now, and you know what the Scripture said, what did the Bible say? says the regions around Galilee is where the prophet, where the Savior is going to come from. So why is it in Matthew chapter 4? Because it's one of the scriptures that Jesus fulfilled. And literally the very argument they made was made from a position of unbelief. And it was in spite of the evidence, not because of it. There are two reasons why those individuals that were trying to chide Nicodemus for believing that Jesus was the Messiah, there are two reasons why they were wrong. They said there's no prophet out of Galilee. Jonah was a prophet from Galilee. Read Jonah sometime. Look at where he is from. Who else came from Galilee? Jesus did. Where was it prophesied? Isaiah chapter 9. Okay, so I want to say this morning, my friend, that what we see over and over again, if you'll go back to Matthew chapter 4, by the way, what we see over and over and over again, uh, the weight of evidence in the Scripture, is that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And He proved it. So you say, what are these verses in Matthew chapter 4? mean? What do they indicate? Well, they indicate that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Scripture. You may be here this morning and you may be a person who would say, well, you know, I think the Bible has mistakes in it. 
or I think that Jesus didn't fulfill all the prophecies of the Scripture. And I will have to say to you, using the same illustration that we just saw of those individuals mentioned from the council in John chapter 7, don't be like people who've never read the book and say it has mistakes. I don't know how many people have told me, the Bible's just written by men. How many of y'all heard that? The Bible's just a man-made, man-written book. I don't remember the name of the individual, but one of the founders of Harvard University, who was also an unbeliever, was challenged by his students to, to take the evidence the way that he had taught, the way to, to, to arrive with, or to determine whether something was false or whether it was true, to take the, the system that he had taught them and to examine the Bible by it. And he examined the Scripture using that system, and his conclusion was there's no way in the world this many people could have concluded, concluded so accurately. There's just no way in the world that this could be anything but a supernatural book. And that was his conclusion as an unbeliever. So this is, this is the Word of God. Man didn't write this book. God wrote it. And God used men to write it. And God took men. He took their personalities and took men out of different ages and different times. And He used them as part of, of the way that He gave an eternal book. He used men who were limited and restricted by time to give a supernatural eternal book. And my friend, if you think the Bible's got mistakes in it, I will kindly say to you, not meaning any offense at all, you've obviously never read it. If you think it's a man-written book, it's because you've never read it. You're just parroting something that you've heard. And it is as wise as saying that no prophet comes from Galilee. It just isn't so. I don't know how many times I've asked the person that said that, They've said, you know, the Bible has mistakes and the Bible's a man-written book. And I've had a copy of the Scripture in my hand and I've, I've just said, show me. Show me the mistakes. Well, I'd have to do some research first. And so I'd say, so you haven't done research yet. <laughs> you believe something and you have no evidence for it. You're not being honest. At least be honest in your unbelief, but you're not being honest about it. You believe something because you want to, not because you have no choice. I've had people say, well, it's got mistakes in it. And uh, they, they say, well, you know what, I'd have to do some research, I'd have to whatever. Well, my friend, if you want to research mistakes into something, you'll find something to support what you believe, but it won't be true. It could be as easily disproved as it could be proven. Let me get practical with you for a moment. What hope do you have if there's no God? What's, your, what's the motive of your unbelief? I believe that the motive of every person's unbelief, of course, is rebellion. That is, we do not want to bow to a God who is set apart from us. Listen, if God is eternal, as we know in our hearts He is, as we know from the Scripture He is, then my friend, it points to the fact that I'm temporal. I'm not eternal. If God is perfect and God is holy, it emphasizes the reality that not only am I the opposite of that, but I'm sinning against Him. If God is wiser... If my, my wisdom is foolishness to God, as my power is weakness to God, if my whatever in comparison with God is nothing, it means God in every way is superior, and I in every way am inferior, and therefore I ought rightfully, as a created being belonging to God, I ought to bow to Him. And that, the problem that people have with bowing is rebellion. We don't want to bow to anything. Matter of fact, we'll bow to something before we'll bow to God, as long as it's inferior to us. Read sometime the response of people who will not believe. The Bible says that they'll worship creatures, four-footed beasts, creeping things. Uh, the, the Old Testament Scripture de describes idols as dumb images. That word's used appropriately. These things cannot speak. They cannot. They're just made. You, you, they literally, a man will craft something from his own hands and then bow to his craftsmanship. And why will a man bow to his craftsmanship? Because he says, look what I've made. And when he bows to something he's made, he's bowing to himself. And you may choose self-worship over worship of a holy God, but my friend, I just want to say to you something. You have no hope if you have no Savior. And Jesus was God's Son. And Jesus is the Savior of the world. And He's the only means for there to be hope. I have two more points I want to make this morning. That's the first one. But that's as far as we're going to make it for time this morning. And so I, I feel like I have no choice but to finish right now with a word of prayer. And we'll finish this message next week. Shall we pray? God, I just pray that You would help us to believe what the Scripture very, very soundly affirms. And that is that Jesus is God. 
And God, if there be any person that's here today that either struggles as a Christian and they struggle with the attacks on, on the Scripture, I pray that You would help us to have the resolve to not be like those individuals of the council who would have told Nicodemus no one came from Galilee that was a prophet, but rather instead help us to be like individuals who search the Scriptures, for in them we think that we have eternal life. And Jesus said, They are they which testify of Me. And may we search for the testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. God, I pray that there's an unbeliever in this place here today. That, Lord, You would show and reveal to their hearts the motive of their unbelief. God, Your Word teaches, and we know by experience, that no person is unbelieving because of lack of evidence. But every person is unbelieving because of an unwillingness to bow to a holy God in heaven. And so I pray that this morning, God, that You would help to affirm us in faith. Help to affirm us in belief. And Lord, if there be a person who needs to receive Jesus as their Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, there's nothing wrong with the person of, of Your Son. There's nothing wrong with the witness of Your Word. Everything's right about those things. And God, Your Holy Spirit confirms that these things are true. And so we know in our hearts what the Scripture says is Your Word. But God, the problem lies with us. We're so prone to wonder. We're so prone to not believe. And so I pray that You would take the message of Your work today and that You would convict and convince us of unbelief. If everyone here this morning would remain with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we'd like to have a time of invitation before we finish our prayer. And so I have respect for everyone else. If I could ask you a couple private questions with no one looking around invading anyone else's privacy. If you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Price, God's Spirit spoken to me today. God has talked to me today. And what He's talked to me about today is the reality that, that I'm an unbeliever. And it is not because of the evidence. It is in spite of the evidence that I do not believe. God's speaking to me about it. And with God's help here today, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I want to trust Him as my Savior today. If that would be you here this, today, this morning, you'd say, don't embarrass me, don't call me out, but God's shown me today that Jesus is the Son of God and I want Him to be my Savior. We just slip your hand up so I could pray for you so I can know about that and help you with that? Anyone today? I want Jesus to be my Savior. Okay? In just a minute, we're going to have a time of invitation if that's you and you want to be saved. Brother Taj is standing in the back of the room and he could open a Bible and show you very, very simply the way of salvation. And you could leave today having confidence that you have eternal life. The second question here this morning. Pastor, I believed that Christ is my Savior and I know it. But the reality of it is, is that sometimes I've also believed lies. I believe things that are aspersions that are cast against the Word of God. I, have, I believe that the, that the accusations that the Bible has mistakes in it or that the Bible is written by men, I've struggled with those things. But I realize today that the, that the issue, the matter at hand, is not that there is not evidence. The matter at hand is that people believe what they wish to and I want to believe the right thing. I just, I'm praying that God would confirm what I've, what I've realized with the help of His Spirit today. And I'm praying that I'd be able to show other people the same thing. If that's you, just slip up your hand. God's spoken to me today. He's reaffirmed things that I know. Just slip it up, slip it back down. I'll see it, acknowledge it, slip it right back down, okay? Well, we're going to have a time of invitation. And the invitation this morning will be very simple. First, we'll finish our prayer. God, I ask that you would bless and move in the invitation now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think we have our pianist yet, so we're just going to open up our hymn books to page 381, and I'll explain the invitation to you. We're going to sing the song, Is You're All on the Altar. Sometimes when the Word of God is preached, the application of the Scripture sometimes goes beyond what the preacher actually says, and that's the way the Spirit of God moves. If you're here today and God's spoken to you and He's shown you something, if your need this morning is salvation, Brother Taj is standing back on my left, on your right, and he's got a Bible. He's ready to help you to know that you have eternal life. If you come with someone, uh, just, just, ask, just ask somebody sitting next to you, will you go with me? I want to make sure that I'm born again, that I've received Jesus as my Savior. If that's your need, the invitation is a time we invite you to come. Uh, the second thing this morning is if God's spoken to you, please follow Him. Please, uh, please respond to what God has said to you. If God talked to you, it is not merely so that you can hear Him. It is so that you can say, yes, Lord. And the invitation is the time in our service when we just simply say that. And it could be that simple. Before we begin to sing, you could just simply say, God, you've shown me this, 
And God, my answer to you is yes. This is how I'm going to live in light of it, or this is how I'm going to respond with my thinking. Please help me. And if you need accountability, you want somebody to pray with you, somebody that would, that would you'd say, well, I need somebody that knows what I've committed to God so that I could have accountability for that. Brother Taj is available for that as well. Does everybody understand the invitation? It's just a time to respond to God's inviting you to hear the truth and to receive it. Page 381, if you're physically able to do so, I'd ask that you please stand unless you feel that you need to remain uh, seated for prayer. We're going to sing as you're all on the altar, and as we sing, make sure that the words of the Psalms are true in your heart.